The first Pacific Exposition has created a Pacific momentum. It's been regarded as the most comprehensive expo in the region. Attended by dignitaries, business figures, and visitors from 19 Pacific countries and territories, symbolizes togetherness and brotherhood. Promoted investment in tourism in Pacific countries with business deals of 104 million New Zealand dollars. In 2021, we welcome you to the second Pacific Exposition virtual exhibition. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, we aim to project optimism by connecting governments, businesses, and key stakeholders to discuss common issues with the Pacific people at the heart of the discussions. As part of a shared commitment to recover together and recover stronger. This exposition will cover current topics. The Pacific Talks will see prominent figures sharing their insights on regional priorities. As we're stepping towards economic recovery, find out what policies lie ahead in the Trade, Investment, and Creative Economy Forum. Hear the efforts to strengthen health infrastructures in the Pacific in the Health Forum. Building resilient tourism in a post-COVID future will be the focus of the Tourism Forum whilst ensuring sustainable fisheries is the focus of the Fisheries Forum. Check out more than 200 virtual booths from leading businesses and our state-of-the-art business matching spaces. Expand your network by using the latest AI technology in our platform. Be a part of the Pacific's most comprehensive exposition. Welcome to the second Pacific Exposition. It's time for the Pacific. First Pacific Exposition has created a Pacific momentum. It's been regarded as the most comprehensive expo in the region. Attended by dignitaries, business figures, and visitors from 19 Pacific countries and territories, symbolizes togetherness and brotherhood. Promoted investment in tourism in Pacific countries with business deals of 104 million New Zealand dollars. In 2021, we welcome you to the second Pacific Exposition virtual exhibition. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, we aim to project optimism by connecting governments, businesses, and key stakeholders to discuss common issues with the Pacific people at the heart of the discussions. As part of a shared commitment to recover together and recover stronger. This exposition will cover current topics. The Pacific Talks will see prominent figures sharing their insights on regional priorities. As we're stepping towards economic recovery, find out what policies lie ahead in the Trade, Investment, and Creative Economy Forum. Hear the efforts to strengthen health infrastructures in the Pacific in the Health Forum. Building resilient tourism in a post-COVID future will be the focus of the Tourism Forum whilst ensuring sustainable fisheries is the focus of the Fisheries Forum. Check out more than 200 virtual booths from leading businesses and our state-of-the-art business matching spaces. 
expand your network by using the latest AI technology in our platform. Be a part of the Pacific's most comprehensive exposition. Welcome to the second Pacific Exposition. It's time for the Pacific. The first Pacific Exposition has created a Pacific momentum. It's been regarded as the most comprehensive expo in the region. Attended by dignitaries, business figures, and visitors from 19 Pacific countries and territories, symbolizes togetherness and brotherhood. Promoted investment in tourism in Pacific countries with business deals of 104 million New Zealand dollars. In 2021, we welcome you to the second Pacific Exposition Virtual Exhibition. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, we aim to project optimism by connecting governments, businesses, and key stakeholders to discuss common issues with the Pacific people at the heart of the discussions. As part of a shared commitment to recover together and recover stronger. This exposition will cover current topics. The Pacific Talks will see prominent figures sharing their insights on regional priorities. As we're stepping towards economic recovery, find out what policies lie ahead in the Trade, Investment, and Creative Economy Forum. Hear the efforts to strengthen health infrastructures in the Pacific in the Health Forum. Building resilient tourism in a post-COVID future will be the focus of the Tourism Forum whilst ensuring sustainable fisheries is the focus of the Fisheries Forum. Check out more than 200 virtual booths from leading businesses and our state-of-the-art business matching spaces. Expand your network by using the latest AI technology in our platform. Be a part of the Pacific's most comprehensive exposition. Welcome to the second Pacific Exposition. It's time for the Pacific. The first Pacific Exposition has created a Pacific momentum. It's been regarded as the most comprehensive expo in the region. Attended by dignitaries, business figures, and visitors from 19 Pacific countries and territories, symbolizes togetherness and brotherhood. Promoted investment in tourism in Pacific countries with business deals of 104 million New Zealand dollars. In 2021, we welcome you to the second Pacific Exposition Virtual Exhibition. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, we aim to project optimism by connecting governments, businesses, and key stakeholders to discuss common issues with the Pacific people at the heart of the discussions. As part of a shared commitment to recover together and recover stronger. This exposition will cover current topics. The Pacific Talks will see prominent figures sharing their insights on regional priorities. 
As we're stepping towards economic recovery, find out what policies lie ahead in the Trade, Investment, and Creative Economy Forum. Hear the efforts to strengthen health infrastructures in the Pacific in the Health Forum. Building resilient tourism in a post-COVID future will be the focus of the Tourism Forum. Whilst ensuring sustainable fisheries is the focus of the Fisheries Forum. Check out more than 200 virtual booths from leading businesses and our state-of-the-art business matching spaces. Expand your network by using the latest AI technology in our platform. Be a part of the Pacific's most comprehensive exposition. Welcome to the second Pacific Exposition. It's time for the Pacific. The first Pacific Exposition has created a Pacific momentum. It's been regarded as the most comprehensive expo in the region. Attended by dignitaries, business figures, and visitors from 19 Pacific countries and territories, symbolizes togetherness and brotherhood. Promoted investment in tourism in Pacific countries with business deals of 104 million New Zealand dollars. In 2021, we welcome you to the second Pacific Exposition Virtual Exhibition. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, we aim to project optimism by connecting governments, businesses, and key stakeholders to discuss common issues with the Pacific people at the heart of the discussions. As part of a shared commitment to recover together and recover stronger. This exposition will cover current topics. The Pacific Talks will see prominent figures sharing their insights on regional priorities. As we're stepping towards economic recovery, find out what policies lie ahead in the Trade, Investment, and Creative Economy Forum. Hear the efforts to strengthen health infrastructures in the Pacific in the Health Forum. Building resilient tourism in a post-COVID future will be the focus of the Tourism Forum. Whilst ensuring sustainable fisheries is the focus of the Fisheries Forum. Check out more than 200 virtual booths from leading businesses and our state-of-the-art business matching spaces. Expand your network by using the latest AI technology in our platform. Be a part of the Pacific's most comprehensive exposition. Welcome to the second Pacific Exposition. It's time for the Pacific.
Selamat datang untuk Anda semua. Greetings from New Zealand. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining us on this trade, investment and creative economy forum at the second Pacific Exposition. My name is Fernanda Aji of the Indonesian Embassy in Wellington. The theme of today's forum is stepping closer towards economic recovery. Before we commence the event, allow me to briefly inform you with few housekeeping notes. The forum will be recorded. If you have any questions during the presentations, please send them through Slido by scanning the QR code on your screen. The moderator will lead the discussion during the Q&A session after the presentations by the panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it is a great honor for me to invite His Excellency, Ambassador Tantowi Yahya, Indonesia's roving ambassador to the Pacific and chairman of the organizing committee of the second Pacific Exposition for opening remarks and to introduce today's moderator, Professor Sia Hueang. To Ambassador Tantowi Yahya, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fernanda. Selamat pagi, selamat siang, selamat sore, selamat malam untuk para penonton di Indonesia. Kia ora, greetings from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm so much honored, you know, uh, to see the great interest and enthusiasms shown by the uh, people all over the places, not only from Indonesia, but also from other countries in the Pacific who were waiting in the holding room thousands of them that shows you the great interest shown by those people in getting to know what the panelists will be delivered and will be shared with you in a time like this where people are expected to get out of this pandemic and get back to normal so distinguished ladies and gentlemen on behalf of the government of the republic of indonesia i'd like to welcome you all to the Trade, Investment, and Creative Economy Forum with the theme, Stepping Closer Towards Economic Recovery. As we know, COVID-19 pandemic has severely taken a toll on national economies and people's livelihoods, particularly for the Pacific Island countries, which rely heavily on tourism. Tourism is one of the sectors that are hardly hit by the border closures. A combined market with more than 300 million people and 2.8 trillion US dollar trade value, the Pacific region is a very lucrative region and can potentially be the engine of growth amidst the tumultuous uncertainty of the world's economic recovery. To attain these goals, Pacific countries will need to diversify its economy through strengthening trade, investment, and creative economy strategies. Seamless flow of goods and services boosts growth and contributes sustainable economy. Ladies and gentlemen, to bolster formidable economic growth, the creative economy industries play a pivotal role generating income of our people. Hence, this forum is held to cater discussions and brainstorming among us in answering questions such as when will we go back to the heydays of robust economic development? When will tourists come to our countries? What business should I invest during this pandemic? So on and so forth. So I'm happy to announce that some prominent figures from bureaucrats and practitioners are here to explore opportunities and hope of these regions. They are His Excellency Luhut Binsar Panjaitan, Coordinating Minister for Maritime and Investment Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia as our keynote speaker. And the panelists are His Excellency Muhammad Lutfi, Minister of Trade of the Republic of Indonesia, Honorable Dr. David Gillespie, Minister for Regional Health and Minister assisting the Minister for Trade and Investment of Australia, Sir Richard Taylor, CEO and Creative Director of Weta Studios New Zealand, and Mr. Simon Tucker, 
Director of Global Stakeholder Affairs at Fonterra, New Zealand. And to, to lead today's discussions, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Professor Sia Hui Ang, Director of the Southeast Asia Center of Asia Pacific Excellence of Victoria University, Wellington. Professor Sia Hui Ang is from New Zealand. He is also the director of the NZ's Southeast Asia Center of Asia Pacific Excellence. In these roles, Professor Sia works closely with various stakeholders and companies on their strategies in Asia and Asia's engagement in New Zealand. Before joining Victoria University of Wellington, Professor Sia was professor and associate dean at the University of Auckland Business School. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Sia Hui Ang to lead today's discussion in this forum. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Sia. The screen is yours, Professor. Very much, I say. Um, Thank um, Yaya. It's my pleasure to be here moderating this session, very important one for every one of us. Um, let me quickly introduce what today we are trying to cover. So welcome everyone to this forum, the Trade Investment Creative Economy Forum. This forum is convened under the theme, Stepping Closer Towards Economic Recovery, as um, Ambassador has mentioned. The forum will bring in speakers from participating countries, and it's good to see some New Zealand presence here as well uh, in the audience um, coming through. Now, COVID-19 pandemic has taken its toll on a lot of economies, and it's not just New Zealand or Indonesia, but also other parts of ASEAN, as well as the Pacific Islands as well. Now, of course, everyone relies on tourism, so almost literally every country uh, in this part of the world get uh, hit at the same time. Now, due to the restrictions for people movement globally, countries have no choice but to adapt, evolve, and learn to live alongside COVID-19, right? So, of course, we are talking about elimination strategy, but at some point, I suspect that we probably have to sort of try to live with it somehow. Pacific countries will need to diversify its industries, which shall be achieved through strengthening trade, investment, creative economy strategies. Now, the same will apply, of course, to ASEAN nations, uh, as well as New Zealand uh, economy too. Now, countries need to ensure that seamless flow of goods, services, and investment boost growth and continue our sustainable economy. Now, as a market with more than 300 million people and 2.4 billion US dollars when it comes to trade value, the Pacific region is a very lucrative region and the entire growth um, a miss in terms of the recovery as well. The PESA Plus, which sets the trading truths for the region and aim to make it easier for to businesses to trade around the Pacific plays an important role in this effort. Therefore, in this forum, we will hope to learn from the speakers to share their knowledge around and hopefully we will take away with quite a few of those things. Now, without much further ado, let me introduce the keynote speaker, His Excellency Luhat Binsa Patjatan. Coordinating Minister for Maritime and Investment Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. His Excellency Pa uh, Luhat began his career in the Indonesian National Armed Forces until his retirement as a four-star general in 1999. Following that, he has had an outstanding and long-standing political career. He was Minister of Trade and Industry in President um, Abdul Rahman's uh, Wahid's Cabinet and Indonesian ambassador to Singapore from 1999 to, to the year 2000. He has subsequently served as coordinating minister for maritime affairs from coordinating minister from, for political, legal, security affairs and chief of staff to President Joko Widodo as well. In 2004, His Excellency found Koba Sujatra Group, which has interest in natural resources electricity, generation, and agriculture. Park Luhat is chairman of Dell Foundation, which has established schools and a technology college for underprivileged students. He is also the founder of Luha Batik, Patiwa, Patiwi Foundation, which nurtures young Indonesian talents. In 2011, Park Luhat received the Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year Award in the Social Development category. 
Now, most recently, His Excellency Pajatan was appointed as Coordinating Minister for Maritime and Investment Affairs for the Onward Indonesia Cabinet. Under this new role, he is responsible for coordinating the following nine ministries, Energy and Mineral Resources, Environment and Forestry, Transportation, Marine Affairs and Fisheries, Public Works and Public Housing, Tourism and Creative Economy, and last but not least, the Indonesian Investment Coordinating Board, the BKPM. Now, one of his many focus areas in his role as Coordinating Minister for the next five years includes to coordinate the dynamic marine debris agenda. Now, unfortunately, Park Duhat cannot be uh, with us here today because he's overseas or in the, on the way to overseas. So, but then we do have a pre-recorded uh, video for him. I would like to express my appreciation to the organizer for, organizer for organizing this flagship event despite the challenging circumstances. This, has, this expo can aid in the creating of a new businesses, opportunity through capitalizing to, uh, on advantages and emerging business train, trends. Today we are fortunate to have a wide range of businesses, investors and other market participants in the forum. It is an honor for me to be here among distinguished keynote speakers and speak about the collaborative initiative designed to achieve higher productivity in Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, capital investment in promising new companies is critical to our uh, economic future, uh, whether to create new jobs, develop new solutions to emerging problems, or seed the new uh, businesses. By 2030, uh, we expected to achieve a 10% net export contribution to GDP, a double uh, the productivity level <coughs> to enhance output while managing costs and gain higher R&D spending share to GDP to build local innovation capabilities. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia has the vision to become a high-income country by 2045, which is 100 years after our independence. To achieve that vision, Indonesia needs to grow by 5.7% annually over the next 20 years, much higher than our, econ our current economic growth of 5%. To meet the growth target, we need to control the COVID-19 pandemic and initiate economic recovery efforts to short term. We need to transform the national economy in the long run by moving toward uh, higher value added industries and green economy. Ladies and gentlemen, a few months ago, Indonesia faced a grave situation due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In mid-July, our country recorded up to 56,757 cases in a day. Health facility and isolation shelter were overwhelmed with the wave of positive cases. It was a difficult time for everyone. However, I relieved to say that the situation in Indonesia today is, has improved. Uh, we successfully reduced our daily infection rate by 99% compared to the peak of new daily cases on 15 July 2021 to 600 new uh, daily cases on 24 October 2021. The number of new cases continues to drop. And uh, Indonesia recently recorded the lowest positive rate of uh, 0 0.93 since the pandemic began. We are also accelerating our vaccination campaign and we have administrated uh, more than 120 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine, which is a significant milestone of, uh, for our country. With the current piece, uh, pace of uh, economic recovery, we expect Indonesia economic growth to rebound uh, from last year negative growth to expand by uh, 3.7 to 4.5 percent by the end of this year. We expect the economic growth to increase next year by 5.2 uh, percent to 5.5 percent and growth to 6 percent afterward through economic transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia has the world largest nickel ore reserve. I am optimistic that Indonesia will play a significant role in the global electric vehicle market due to multinational collaboration and associated investment in the country. 
Our previous successes in developing stainless steel production is evident of our export numbers. Previously, as one of our leading export vehicle export, were continually higher than iron and steel export. However, since 2020, increased steel production has increased iron and steel export, making a significant higher than vehicle export, even during the COVID-19 period. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to emphasize Indonesia's commitment to green energy. Indonesia will be an integral part of the global supply chain for the battery and electric vehicle industry. Indonesia is also fully committed to support the Paris Agreement to reduce carbon emission. Indonesia ratified the Paris Agreement through law number 16 of uh, 2016. Hence, we are committed to our NDC of 29 unconditional reduction and 41% conditional reduction. We have performed a detailed bottom-up analysis on identifying how to reach this target, for, exam for example, the installation of renewable energy infrastructure. Over the next 10 years, we, install, we will install 40.6 gigawatt of renewable energy. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot make effort to achieve higher productivity in isolation. We must endeavor further to nurture and strengthen our collaboration, which can provide us with the tools to address today's modern world uh, ongoing challenge effectively. Cooperation with other countries has rapidly expanded from traditional areas such as infrastructure, resources, and communication to newly emerging areas of the economy such as advanced manufacturing, finance, e-commerce, IT, human resources, and others. With increasing investment and newly emerging technology, the future knowledge economy will undergo profound sweeping technology, social, and economic challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, we should build international cooperation upon mutual benefits realized through cooperation and collaboration, not rivalry and competition to make the world a better place to live for all. I want to take this opportunity to share a bit about the Archipelagic Island State, ICE Forum. The ICE Forum was established to become a platform that can identify and work toward actionable, concrete collaboration to address the challenges faced by Archipelagic and Island State globally. The ICE Forum has provided strategic activities for Pacific communities to promote and empower uh, human resources in this region. And the forum has also developed and implemented programs around research and development and entrepreneurship to create an environment of innovation in the Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, to facilitate the growth of the sustainable and equitable uh, blue economy at national, regional, and global scales, the ICE program has worked tirelessly to introduce the Marie Strategic Initiative. For example, the Blue Startup Hub acts as a global communication and a knowledge resource platform and engage with stakeholders from 47 ICE Forum participating countries by helping its lender uh, grow their business. Also, the Blue Financing Strategic Document serves as one of the foundations for developing and accessing a credible blue uh, bond framework, which has become an integrated part of the SDG government securities framework issue in September 2021. As we move into uncertain times ahead, the IS Forum will continue to strive to be one <coughs> open initiative and engaging platform to provide intelligent and innovative solution. Innovative, innovative financing support, technical aid, and meaningful international partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, there are still numerous areas of trade, investment, and cooperation that Indonesia and Pacific countries need to explore together to address the evolving challenges of an ever-changing world while investing <coughs> in the people and ideas to make uh, brighter. Future, poss future possible, we need to be proactive, adaptive, and agile. In closing, I hope we can stay connected, work together, and support each other to forge and concrete collaboration that benefit all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, His Excellency Luhaj Binsa Panjatan, Coordinating Minister for
Maritime and Investment Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. Now, let me move on and let me now introduce the first panelist uh, for today, His Excellency Mr. Muhammad Lutfi, Minister of, Minister of Trade of the Republic of uh, Indonesia. Uh, welcome, Park. Uh, His, uh, His Excellency Muhammad Lutfi was appointed as Minister of Trade of the Republic of Indonesia on the 23rd of December 2020 by His Excellency President Joko Widodo. Prior to his appointment, he was the 20th Indonesian Ambassador to the United States of America. This is his second time served as the Minister of Trade after his first one back in 2014. Pat, Lu Pat Luffy has uh, held several leadership positions in the Indonesian government. Prior to his assignment as Minister of Trade back in 2014, he was Indonesian Ambassador to Japan from 2010 to 2013 and Chairman of the Indonesian Investment Coordinating Board from 20, 2005 to 2009. Born in Jakarta 1969, uh, His Excellency Luffy started his career journey as an entrepreneur. His true passion in nurturing young in Indonesian entrepreneurs led him to become the Chairman of the Indonesian Young Entrepreneurs Association from 2001 to 2004 and has been an inspirational figure for Indonesian young entrepreneurs. In 2008, His Excellency Lutfi received global recognition from the World Economic Forum when named as one of the young global leaders in 20, 2008, among other international young leaders, including Larry Page and Sergin Brin of Google. And everyone knows those names, I'll run alongside uh, the minister. His keen interest in diplomacy and world affairs has, was demonstrated during his tenure as the Indonesian ambassador to Japan since 2010. Under his leadership, he navigated the bilateral relationship between the two countries and multiplied Japan's direct investment to Indonesia by almost seven folds. As the chairman of the Indonesian Investment Coordinating Board, he secured numbers, a lot of numbers of high profile investment projects and spearheaded several direct investment policy reforms. Among others, his notable key achievement includes one stock service for investment licensing and the new investment law of 2007. During his time as Minister of Trade in 2014, he was able to maintain inflation and boosted national export on the midst of global oil price turmoil. In the same year, he received a Bintang Mahaputra Adipradana. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> One of the uh, highest civilian honors. I'm coming to an end. Um, ministers so from the government of Indonesia and his dedication for his uh, legacies. Now, of course, uh, he's married with one daughter. While he's an enthusiastic golfer, he's also enjoy basketball, swimming, and reading. Over to you, Park. Uh, thank you, Professor. So I was asked uh, by the Ambassador Tanto Yahya to explain how this COVID-19 uh, and trade with the Pacific should be a bouncing wall for economy to grow back again. Like my uh, coordinating minister, my senior minister, Paluhut, just mentioned that Indonesia is a country in a run. We are a country in a hurry. Uh, if you look, the studies by OECD uh, had uh, come to say that uh, countries uh, that would like to progress from middle income, that is countries that today are uh, making about $4,000 per capita per year, needs to triple that uh, into uh, uh, $12,000 in order to be an advanced or high income country. And in order to do that, a country since 1969 has to have more younger generations than older generations, meaning that the demographic bonus that Indonesia has today will end soon. And before it ends, Indonesia needs to triple the GDP to 12,000. That number will end in between 2038 and 2040. So basically right now, Indonesia has three, has about 18 to 17 years in order to triple the GDP to become a high income country. 
And speed bumps uh, like COVID-19 has not been very, uh, very kind to Indonesia. My uh, senior minister says that uh, 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 at one point in July, Indonesia uh, had 58,000 cases a day. And in order to get that 58,000 cases, Indonesia needs to test around 700,000 tests PCR a day. At $100, Professor, that means 17 million US dollars a day. And we did that at 700,000 testing a day, about two weeks. Just from that, it cost us a billion dollars just in PCR tests. So this is a massive speed bump. And if you look at Indonesia economic growth, uh, in quarter two, 2021, we are already at 7.1% compared to the year before. True, it's a low base, but nevertheless, it was a big speed bump. And because of that, Indonesia will not meet uh, our expectations to have a 5.5% uh, growth this year. So my point is, you know, we have to mitigate this COVID-19 together. Uh, no one is safe until everyone is safe. No one is vaccinated until everyone is vaccinated because there is no good for a country. For example, United Kingdom, uh, England basically had AstraZeneca for its people. But right now, they are probably one of the worst cases because of the, the new variant. And, you know, it comes from countries like Africa's or India's or South, South, South Asia that, you know, just you will not be safe until everyone is safe. So, ladies and gentlemen, then if you look at the, why trade has to become one of the bouncing back mechanism in order for us to go back to prosperity. Um, I've, been, I've been very, very... Um, discouraged, especially if um, I came from ASEAN trade ministers uh, a meeting back in August, I mean in September, and I just came back from OECD for mini WTO meeting in Paris and also for G20 meeting in Sorrento. Um, trade right now has become an emotional thing for countries. You know, we would like to help ourselves uh, in order uh, to, to gain for our own good, for our uh, inside of the country's good. This will not do no good in a country that, in a world that have a, a value chain for everyone. So therefore, uh, this, uh, uh, this expositions uh, that, that leads by, by uh, my ambassador in New Zealand, I think is very, very important. And this is only one among a few that we're talking how we go back to trade. Because if you look at Geneva for WTO, everyone is stuck with an issue happened in 1988. You know, they're talking about Doha. Uh, my colleague ministers, you know, talking about uh, Uruguay round in 1985. You know, most of those ministers was not born in 1985. So... Uh, I would like to congratulate that, you know, this is something that we have to do together. Uh, why is that important? So if you look uh, at, at our numbers with the Pacific, Indonesian number with the Pacific, you know, we trade around uh, $8.8 .8 billion. We sell about, uh, about $3 billion and we buy about $5 billion. So in 2020, uh, 2020, Indonesia has a deficit with the region about 2.1 billion US dollars. Is that bad? It's not bad. Why? Because we're buying from the Pacific things that we need to boost our industries or what we call intermediate goods. We buy lignite coal from Australia. What do we use this lignite coal for? We use this lignite coal to, to burn our furnace, our steel furnace. And our steel furnace right now, mentioned by Paluho just now, uh, we are exporting about 10.86 billion US dollars of steel to the world. Uh, January to September this year, we already grew about 96%, about $14 billion. Uh, and we are the second largest steel producer in the world. So this is, is a very important import from Australia. We import oil, we import coal, we import uh, aluminum. This is all intermediary is good that, you know, to enhance our industrializations in the country. So trade is an important tool for us to get back. I think that's my introductions, Professor, and I, I, I'm more than happy to speak even more uh, after the other panelists. Thank you, Professor. Um, 
Thank you, Park Luffy. Um, I know you'll be leaving soon after this, so can I just, on behalf of um, the audience, ask you a couple of questions, uh, if you can spare a couple of minutes yes, uh, please, with sorry. us. So, um, the first one, now, how can international trade play its roles in speeding up the economic recovery in the Pacific region? Um, like I mentioned to you, Professor, that uh, trade is a mechanics that I think for uh, for 2,000 years has one of the modality for us to progress, create efficiency, uh, uh, worse in competitions in the past, and because of that, you know, we fight poverty. Uh, it's, it's been tested through times. But now we have a different challenge. Uh, if it was in the past, you know, because asymmetrical in, as informations, uh, we can create uh, opportunity of that and create competitions. Um, the efficient ones become winners. And because of that, the efficiency, you know, we can create prosperity. That time has ended when uh, Google and when asymmetrical information is not there anymore. So my point is, right now, it's a time for collaborations. Uh, because this is a time of collaborations, we cannot just win myself, uh, win ourselves, but we have to win together. My point was, you know, um, uh, uh, because of that, the collaboration is important. It's sometimes it's easy to say collaborations uh, is uh, uh, easy to say, but it is not because in collaborations, everyone has to bring their best to the table. And because of that, uh, there is no winners or losers. There are only collaborations, collaborative efforts that we can split the income together. So this is a new thing. That's why digital economy is very, very important for the future. And because of this modality of collaborations, um, and Professor, I think this is one of our uh, method, our, our, our methodologies in order to win uh, in the future. And trade has to become a modality for us to fight poverty together. Now, just following on, on on that, a quick question around free trade agreements, because Australia, Indonesia, and, you know, and of course, um, New Zealand as well is actually part of a, a lot of uh, trade agreements together, right? How can that help the Pacific region or how can we as a group, right, help the Pacific region to be part of this wider global value chain? Well, Indonesia and Australia has uh, the, the first comprehensive partners, economic partnership agreement last year. So it's enacted and it's been ratified. Uh, Indonesia, uh, Australia, New Zealand is also in a pack of ASEAN, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and SAFTA, a pack uh, trade agreement also back uh, since I think in the mid 2000s. And now uh, we are negotiating with Fiji and we are negotiating with other islands, countries in the region as well. But this is something to connect everyone into global value chain. Uh, like I said, this is a collaboration, it's a new methodology, new things that we are uh, thinking. And in the future also, Professor, this is uh, this methodology of winning together is, uh, is a mantra. So I told everyone you know, in, in, in my country, in order for Indonesia to sell more, Indonesia has to, main, uh, has to be able to buy more also from other countries. This is a collaboration. This is a new thing of a, a global value chain. And with that, Indonesia would like to be a partners with the Pacific that, you know, with 270 million people growing at maybe 2%, 3% of populations every year uh, uh, will be the uh, fourth or fifth largest economy in 2045 as part uh, to solve people, uh, uh, to solve a uh, uh, region's problem that is fighting poverty. Thank you, Professor. Yep, just a very quick one, uh, Minister, just bear with me. So um, now you mentioned about the, um, uh, the Indonesian economy having to triple in the next 18 years. So uh, uh, very ambitious plan, but uh, definitely something that, uh, you know, New Zealand will appreciate that we are actually quite small, but we are, you know, not, not, not as stressful when it comes to growth at the same time. But uh, do you see that over time, uh, how do the... Um, the trade deficit, say, for example, between Indonesia and the Pacific region can be reduced because you are saying that, you know, it's um, potentially as you grow, you might actually widen the trade deficit. Um, 
My point was, you know, trade is important and trade deficit is okay uh, because what I bought, I, what what Indonesia buys from from the region is something to enhance our industrializations, enhance our uh, intermediate goods in order to create more value in the country. So my point is, uh, it's okay to have a trade deficit because I'm using it for something else more value chain. So this is something that we have to promote. Uh, you know, right now, Professor, well, between January to, uh, uh, to September, my deficit with Australia alone is more than $4 billion. But it's fine. Why? Because I'm, I was explaining to you, I'm buying lake night. Uh, that lake night is, for, is uh, you know, uh, uh, firing my, my furnace so then I can, I can burn my steel. I can sell it back to the Chinese uh, about five, four, five, six times more. Uh, then no one can beat our uh, cost structure because the nickel that we have is right in our backyard. So this is, I think, a collaboration of the most important parts, you know, that we are prospering together. Um, you know, we are, we have a lot of challenge, Professor, in the, in the future, especially with the green economy. I saw Australia that, you know, with a commitment of zero carbon in 2050, you know, tip my hand, you know, and I'm going to talk to Dan Tehan and um, uh, Damien O'Connor from New Zealand to make sure that, you know, we are responsible for the world too, for this green economy and sustainable economy, but at the same time, create prosperity for the, for the region. All right, um, terima kasih, Pak. Um, thank you again, um, His Excellency, Mr. Muhammad Lutfi, Minister, Minister of Trade of the Republic of Indonesia. Thanks, Pak. Thank you, Professor. Now, so um, let me now move on. Uh, let me introduce the second uh, panelist, the Honorable Dr. David Gillespie, Minister for Regional Health and Minister assisting the Minister for Trade uh, and Investment uh, of Australia. Dr. Gillespie is the Minister for Regional Health and Minister assisting the Minister for Trade and Investment since July 2011, uh, sorry, 2000 and 2021 actually. It has been elected to the House, he has been elected to the House of Representatives for Lynn, uh, New South Wales in 2013 2016, 2019, and also is the current Deputy Leader of the House. Dr. Kelsby was a member of the Speaker's Panel from July 2019 to 2021, July as well. Previous ministerial roles include Assistant Minister for Rural Health from July 2016 to January 2017, Assistant Minister for Health from January 2017, to December 2017 and Assistant Minister for Children and Families from December 2017 to August 2018. Before entering the Federal Parliament, Dr. Gillespie was Director of Physician uh, Training at uh, Port Maguire Base Hospital from 1997 to 2010. He's also a gastroenterologist and, and consultant physician from 1991 to 2013, and a small business manager and company director as well. He holds an MBBS from the University of Sydney, the equivalent of a doctor of medicine, and is a fellow of the Royal Australian College of Physicians. Again, unfortunately, Dr. Gillespie cannot be with us today. I have a pre-recorded video from him as well. Excellencies and distinguished delegates, it's a real pleasure to join you today. I want to thank the Government of the Republic of Indonesia for organising the Second Pacific Exposition. This event comes at a time that cooperation to boost trade and investment is more important than ever. COVID-19 has had a deep and profound impact on the health and economies across the region. From a health perspective, many lives and communities have been hit hard. It's been an incredibly tough year for businesses and industries navigating the uncertainty of lockdowns, supply chain disruptions, declines in revenue and loss of clients. And it's been a huge public policy task for governments 
to respond to keeping health systems operating, ensuring people are safe and secure, supporting businesses and the economy, and rolling out vaccines. Australia is committed to working cooperatively with the countries in the Pacific to address the trade and economic challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. It has shown us that we are only as healthy, prosperous, safe and secure as our region. As a region, we must get our health, economic security and development settings right so we can create the environment that fosters integration, engagement, innovation and entrepreneurship. That is why Australia is taking a holistic approach to supporting our region to be strong, secure and prosperous. We pivoted our development program to address the full spectrum of impacts from this pandemic. From sharing vaccines and critical medical equipment to supporting governments to continue social sector expenditure and avert fiscal crises. Helping the most vulnerable, including women, girls and the poorest communities, Australia's Partnership for Recovery strategy is making a difference. Australia has already shared more than 1.9 million vaccines with the Pacific nations, 2.2 million with Indonesia, and in June we pledged to share up to 15 million vaccine doses with the Pacific and Timor-Leste. Despite the challenges, there is a lot of upside and opportunity in our region. One of the best ways we can do that is to strengthen economic integration, empower businesses to create jobs and to get our economies growing again. We are using every tool we have to encourage trade, investment and business to flourish. The entry into force of PESA Plus in December last year was a big step forward. It provides a platform for greater economic integration and to bolster more trade and investment in the Pacific. PACER Plus complements existing Australian activities geared to assisting Pacific countries increase trade and attract investment. I also welcome stronger cooperation between Australia and Indonesia, including to boost trade and investment in the Pacific. The MOU between Indonesia and Australia on trilateral cooperation with Pacific Island countries, signed in September, reaffirms Australia's and Indonesia's commitment to develop trilateral cooperation between our two countries and Pacific partners in areas of mutual interest to further support the development and economic prosperity of the region. This forum, focusing on trade, investment and creative economy, is an important opportunity to explore further cooperation to, to promote stronger trade and investment between our economies and support economic recovery. I'd like to thank all participants today and look forward to hearing the conclusions from your discussions on how we can work together on trade, investment and creative economy issues to build a more resilient region. Thank you. Um, that was the Honourable Dr. David Gillespie, Minister for Regional Health and Minister assisting the Minister for Trade and Investment of Australia. Now, without much further ado, let me introduce the third panellist, Sir Richard Taylor, C CEO and Creative Director of Weta Workshop. Sir Richard Taylor is the founder of the Weta Companies and co-owner of Weta workshop which he runs alongside his wife Tanya Roger in their home city of Wellington, New Zealand. With more than 30 years of experience working in the world's creative industries, Richard is the CEO and design and effects supervisor of this award-winning company. As a passionate creative um, at the core, creative person, well, creative person at the core uh, of Better Workshop, Richard collaborates each day with his colleagues and friends across a diverse range of artistic and technical disciplines. With 330 crew and 17 departments, a workshop can 
take on most creative challenges on offer. Richard has won five Academy Awards across three disciplines for special effects makeup, visual effects, and costume design. He has also received four BAFTAs, two VES Awards, and more than 30 national and international awards for his work within the creative industries. In 2010, Richard was made a Knight Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for his services to them, New Zealand Entrepreneur of the Year, and 2012, he was named New Zealander of the Year. Richard and Tanya are patrons of the New Zealand Neon Neonatal Trust and are heavily involved in the Wellington community, giving their time to charity projects and initiatives. Richard supports and exists the world of wearable arts, to which a lot of us know about it here in New Zealand. Competition held annually in Wellington and has been a guest judge in the competition for over 15 years. Richard has been a regular guest because to schools, universities, conferences, and with government delegations over the years. Weta Workshop has provided the design and physical effects for more than 15 firms, numerous TV shows, and multiple location-based experiences, best known for their work on the globally acclaimed The Lord of the Rings. And a lot of those out, out, out there in the Pacific and ASEAN probably heard about that one, and the Hobbit trilogies, as well as the Chronicles of Narnia, King Kong, Avatar, District 9, and Ghost in the Shell, to name a few. Weather Workshop also operates a number of uh, popular tourist attractions, runs a game studio and produces high-end collectibles. They also specialize in the design and manufacture of location-based visitor experiences. It's here award-winning work on the Gallipoli, the scale of our world exhibition in collaboration with the Papa Museum. has attracted more than 3 million visitors and becomes the most visited exhibition in New Zealand's history. Buck Lab is another spectacular hands-on visitor experience created by Weta Workshop and Tipapa now touring internationally. Richard and Tanya co-own the children's IP and television production company called Kokiko Pictures, which developed the award-winning television shows Jane and the Dragon, The Witch Walks, The Kidits, and the reimagined The Jerry Anderson classic Thunderbirds Are Gone. Uh, well, are go. Richard and Tanya also co-own Stardog LP, uh, a fine art and IP development company that helped bring to life great Broadmoors, the world of Dr. Gobots, a groundbreaking mixed reality game on the Magic Lab uh, Leap platform. Richard has spent more than 20 years working in China as well, building a highly respected relationships with local players as well as local and central government um, over to you, Sir Richard Taylor. Thank you very much, sir. That was quite the introduction. I hope I can uh, now deliver a speech as full. Uh, and as uh, I guess as Monty Python once said, now for something entirely different, I am going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we've been up to through COVID, the challenges that we have had and uh, how we are trying to find our way through it. Uh, along with all of our colleagues and other business people here in New Zealand as we tackle the new lockdown. Uh, I have a video to play and hopefully uh, if that would be all right to play. So as has just been said, we're probably best known for our feature film work on multiple movies that some of you watching today may have seen. And that's given us a wonderful uh, career but we do a lot more than that. Primarily though, uh, across multiple departments, we deliver craft-based experiences to people around the world, whether that be film or television, location-based experiences, museums, digital gaming, merchandising, etc. But the thing I thought I'd talk about today, and uh, as a test case of really the challenges of the last couple of years, is a location-based experience that we chose to build in Auckland we had been conceptualizing this early in 2019, never really appreciating that the world was going to be closed down by a, a, a worldwide pandemic. When COVID actually hit, uh, my wife Tanya and I and my uh, friends and colleagues here at the workshop had a very significant decision to make 
because we could uh, choose to basically put this on the back burner, uh, count the money lost that we had already invested and sit out uh, the pandemic with the hope that maybe we could reinvent this offering again in the future. But uh, on some level of you know, retrospection, we made the decision that it was inappropriate for us to, to not forge forward with the thought that if anything that New Zealand was going to desire coming out of the back end of lockdown, it would be creative offerings. And we made the decision therefore to forge forward. Uh, we borrowed money from the bank, we invested uh, heavily ourselves, and we began building in earnest, having uh, spent a number of months conceptually designing and drafting up what we wanted to do. We couldn't have undertaken this if we didn't have an extraordinary partner in the Sky City team up in Auckland. Uh, we built our exhibition, one floor above the All Blacks experience on, in the old um, event centre on Federal Street. And it has been the support and collaboration with the Sky City Company that has allowed us to actually navigate through the past challenges of the last year. Thankfully, we were able to open up into a COVID-free New Zealand and uh, for the first seven months, uh, invited 75,000 guests into this walkthrough uh, immersive experience and uh, received an overwhelmingly warm response from the people that came along, which was really, really lovely. At its core, the concept behind this experience is a fantastical film effects workshop. Uh, the ability to invite our guests into an experience that uh, otherwise they may not get to see, which is the other side of the door of an effects workshop like Weta. And uh, then we unpack for our audience how we would build a horror movie, a fantasy movie, and a science fiction film. And uh, invite our visitors to come along for the ride, but also interact heavily in the creative process of doing that with the desire to re-inspire in those that may have lost the joy of the creative journey. And of course, fully inspire young people who are yet to make a decision on where their careers may go into the dream of what a future creative career could be. So we've tried to create uh, three uh, pieces of media, three feature films, as if they are real movies yet to be made and uh, give the impression that we're in production of those. Now, of course, COVID has has hit again in New Zealand, and our government uh, has chosen to uh, do uh, initially a nationwide uh, lockdown, but now our major city of Auckland uh, is still in lockdown 10, 11 weeks after it initially began. And uh, understandably, uh, this has been a good decision to protect our um, our population and try and uh, help Auckland journey through these challenges. But like all business owners in New Zealand, specifically in Auckland, this sets up its own uh, extraordinary and unprecedented challenges. We of course want to keep our team together. So we continue to uh, hire our team on, uh, on, uh, over, the, over the last 10 weeks. And uh, they sit tight enthusiastically waiting to get back to work. Uh, but of course, not only are you paying your team, you're also losing the uh, income that otherwise would be coming from the process of running a endeavor such as this. No different than any other business in New Zealand or now in Auckland as they have tried to navigate around the, uh, the, the challenges of COVID. And of course, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a reality for companies all over the world. We are of the view that we must stay positive, we must stay in support of our team, we must uh, uh, focus on uh, the positivity that we are going to come through this, we're going to come out of this, we are going to uh, see our, uh, our ability to reopen 
that eventually, of course, our borders will reopen and we will be able to once again share uh, what we have been so inspired to build with so many people uh, and, uh, and try and bring that little bit of delight and joy to those that may come and visit us. Location-based experiences, I feel, are an important component of the entertainment uh, offering of the world. Film and TV are fabulous things to work on, and we've had a joyful career doing that. But you're always offering your work through someone else's medium, the medium of film. And often they will enhance what you have done and, uh, and create something greater than what you initially built. But with location-based experiences, the audience see what you made and what you created raw and in, uh, in the first person. And for creatives like ours, that is a joyful uh, opportunity to really put your creative art out there and put your creative neck on the line. It gives a tactility and a reality to the environment. And in a world where we are entering uh, another level of digital engagement, the ability to keep tactility and craftsmanship alive in people's lives is an important aspect uh, of our creative journey in my perspective. We, of course, though, are also excited about where the digital um, medium of uh, of of interactivity is going. We're very focused ourselves on the near future of the metaverse. Uh, we're excited by the fact that uh, we can try and create new masterworks that may sit within the metaverse. And for young creatives that are training right now at universities and polytechs around the South Pacific and Asian region, there is no greater opportunity than today to indelibly stamp your mark on the creative stage of the world because of these new platforms and these new opportunities to create, uh, to create really a new renaissance coming out of the back end of the COVID crisis. As we have seen with humanity again and again right across history, uh, crises inspire creative endeavor. They inspire a renaissance of thinking, of doing, of inspiring in the creative medium. And it's lovely to think that there will be a highly trained, highly inspired group of young designers, creatives, makers, able to take on these challenges and into the workforce, uh, ready to develop uh, this new um, world and this new renaissance that we all desire to move into. Of course, we need that constitution as well for whatever we're going to be offering through the metaverse, but that's another subject that we can uh, consider as we go forward. I'm very happy to answer any questions if uh, well, I've still got a few minutes left. Hi, Richard. Um, if you don't mind, we actually do the uh, Q&A right at the end. So I'm going to ask the audience to hold their horses. Okay, I can keep, I, would you like me to just talk a little bit more about what we're up to? Oh, yes, sure. Of course, up, any updates would be nice. Okay, well, we, we thankfully, uh, with respect to our film work, uh, we can still work remotely in New Zealand for clients around the world. We do have a challenge with uh, foreign films being able to get into New Zealand at the moment and as has as has been well documented sadly New Zealand lost the Lord of the Rings television series which has moved to uh, the UK to be made that's a huge loss specifically for the Auckland uh, industry but for New Zealand as a whole uh, obviously there is a the sadness that we were the home of Middle Earth uh, but also, of course, from an economic and employment level, it's a huge impact on our country. The very real um, consequences of a, uh, of a, a sort of watertight MIQ challenge and a limited number of uh, opportunities for people to travel through the border is a very, very uh, real and impactful consequence of this, uh, of this lockdown. 
Uh, I myself would normally be traveling to China one week in every four uh, to work with our clients and our colleagues, our partners up in China. And uh, that has not been possible for two years now. And that has very serious um, consequences with respect to our ability to do a job that you simply can't fully do across Zoom. And there are hundreds of companies in New Zealand, tens of thousands of companies around the world that rely on a gregarious uh, physical interactivity where Zoom uh, plays a tiny component in your capability to run your business. And, uh, you know, you, 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 you need those personal interactivity and art direction abilities to be able to keep uh, the creative quality and the inspiration and ideas, uh, innovations basically flowing freely uh, through a project. And that's, that's something that um, in this new world order that we're living in, we are very seriously struggling with how we uh, facilitate and keep alive those, um, those human to human connections that are so um, paramount in our professional careers. Thankfully, uh, we have clients that have been uh, long, uh, uh, long living with, you know, we, we've got clients that have been with us a very long time, and they are respectful and thoughtful and caring at this point about the situation that we're in as a country. But, uh, but understandably, economically, uh, for the country, but also uh, at a personal level for a small company like ours, uh, these things really start to take hold. So um, it, it therefore just demands a sense of positivity and, uh, and uh, opportunity that once we actually are able to uh, get free of this lockdown, get free of uh, the challenges of uh, travel, uh, we can really start to find uh, better and bigger business for ourselves and our industry out around the world. I do hope and do feel confident that the general public of the world will be, have an insatiable uh, appetite to get out and about themselves. And so therefore the sort of things that we offer and the things that New Zealand can offer as a tourist attraction will become highly um, uh, sought after and, uh, and people will venture again out to our small place in the world and come and enjoy uh, what we can offer uh, as a country and hopefully what we can offer as tourist attractions for those guests when they come and visit. And, uh, you know, all, all, we can, uh, all we can do at this point is hang on and uh, plan ahead, uh, stay strong as a group, as, as an industry and uh, as a country and uh, remain optimistic that uh, around the corner is a somewhat warmer glow than the one that uh, we've been experiencing at the moment. But uh, this is a worldwide reality, and so people sympathize with each other and, uh, and understand that, uh, sadly, this is the world that we're living in right now. But uh, let's hope uh, New Zealand uh, can once again uh, be the most important uh, part of, uh, that we can be in the small place that we sit in the world. So uh, exciting times, but also troubling times, of course. I think that's uh, my video just coming to an end. So if I remember. Perfect correctly. timing for you. Yeah. Right. All right. Thanks, Richard. Now let's hold our horses on you for the Q and A. So again, thank you, Sir Richard Taylor, CEO and Creative Director of Weta Workshop. Now, uh, everyone in the audience, um, can I encourage us to put your questions onto Slido, uh, whether it's for Sir Richard or for. Simon Tucker, which will be our next um, panelist. Now, uh, with that, um, let me now introduce the fourth and final panelist, Mr. Simon Tucker, Director of Global Stakeholder Affairs, Fonterra Cooperative Group Limited. Simon Tucker is Director of Global Stakeholder Affairs at Fonterra. In this role, he leads teams responsible for Fonterra's global trade strategy, its corporate sustainability and environmental 
partnerships programs, the company's relationships with New Zealand and foreign governments and Fonterra's industry partners. So that's quite a big portfolio there, Simon. As a member of the Cooperative Affairs Leadership Team, Simon's role contributes to the execution of Fonterra's strategy, particularly uh, in terms of trade access, management of geopolitical risks, development of world-leading environmental sustainability credentials, and the cooperative's efforts to enhance its national and global identity and reputation. Simon has spent over 12 years in the New Zealand dairy industry, including in leadership roles at Dairy New Zealand, the Dairy Companies Association of New Zealand, and with Fonterra Cooperative Groups US-based businesses at, and at its headquarter office in Auckland. During his career, Simon has also spent considerable time working for the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He was the minister, Ministry's Assistant Secretary based in Auckland and served as New Zealand's High Commissioner to Canada and was current, concurrently High Commissioner to Jamaica as well in Africa, um, well, in, in the Americas. Now, earlier, people Diplomatic assignments, including postings as counselor and head of trade team at the New Zealand Embassy in Washington, D.C., and three years at the New Zealand Embassy in Tehran, Iran. He also spent several years working in Parliament as advisor to the Minister of Trade. Over the past 10 years, Simon has also held a number of governance and advisory roles, including in the areas of economic development, trade, resource management and education. Simon is married to Penny Tucker and have three children. He's a graduate of the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. Um, welcome over to you, Simon. Well, thank, thank you, Professor. Uh, I really welcome this opportunity. Kia ora tato, uh, salamat siang, and gr greetings to everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure, and I'd like to recognize too my, my distinguished fellow panelists uh, it's always uh, a pleasure to, to speak with Sir Richard uh, as we shift perhaps from the creative sector to, to the food industry that I'll be speaking uh, on behalf of today. Um, look, this is a, a subject of, of very great importance, you know, how trade investment can facilitate the post-COVID-19 economic recovery in the wider Pacific region. Um, and I think, you know, we, we know the past 18 months have been exceptionally challenging for all of us uh, as we've continued to navigate uh, the impacts of, of the pandemic. Let, let me just start too by recognising the Government of Indonesia for bringing us together virtually for these uh, vitally important uh, conversations and, and Fonterra really welcomes the opportunity to, to be involved. For, for those of you who need a little bit of background, Fonterra is a, a New Zealand dairy cooperative which is owned by 10,000 of our farmer shareholders uh, and we sell dairy products to over 130 countries uh, around the globe. The, the Asia Pacific region is, is very important to us and it's an integral part of our, our global supply chain. Our exports to Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands alone uh, are valued at about US dollars 3.5 billion per annum. Um, so that it's a very significant market. And we also have uh, some uh, quite important investments in manufacturing and supply chain capability, including in countries like Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Australia, and, and other parts of, of, of the region. In Indonesia, uh, our business uh, supports hundreds of jobs uh, and our manufacturing facility and Chikarang uh, makes products that we then export. We, we sell in Indonesia, but we also export around Southeast Asia and into the Pacific Island countries. So Indonesia is a very important part of our, of our business. And we're, we're proud as well in Indonesia to be working to support the development of the local dairy sector through our dairy cluster partnership in Western Sum Sumatra and our collaboration with the Indonesian government to grow dairy expertise through dairy scholarships uh, and a young farmers network. Uh, we, we also have a strong presence in the Pacific Island nations. We've been active in that part of the world for over 40 years. Uh, and we have some long-term relationships with, with 18 key markets. Um, our consumer brand, Anchor, uh, well known in New Zealand and, and in many Pacific Island countries. Um, and I think our commitment to the Pacific reflects New Zealand's close political and, and personal ties with that region. And 
the dairy nutrition we supply there is something we're very proud of to be contributing to the well-being of, of the Pacific Island communities. So I just want to talk very briefly about how we've navigated COVID to date, um, because the past 18 months has been historically challenging for businesses across the region as, as we've dealt with COVID-19. And, and look, while huge challenges remain, uh, and um, I certainly want to recognise that, that economies and countries with tourism as a major part of their, their economy have really suffered hard, but other economies in the region have actually held up quite well. And we've found markets to be relatively buoyant for, for food products, which is positive. Um, for Fonterra, while we've seen changes in consumption patterns as markets have experienced various forms of lockdown, uh, overall demand has remained, has remained pretty strong. I think one of the, the key things for us has been our ability to adapt. Our scale means that we can pivot both across markets, but also across uh, demand patterns and, and product lines. You know, for example, we do a lot of food service business to hotels and restaurants, and we found that as lockdowns hit and tourism stopped, and out of home dining really slowed down, we were able to shift volume into consumer products as people ate more at home. And that actually protected our, our business quite successfully. We've also moved in a big way uh, deeper into digital home delivery um, so consumers can enjoy their products safely at home. Um, and our e-commerce channels have, have really gone off the map in terms of, of their growth as people shop online. Um, Shipping, logistics, supply chain, as I think we all know, remains pretty challenging. Fonterra, we're lucky because of our scale and our partnerships. We've been able to navigate that, but I think this is going to be an ongoing challenge for companies in the Asia Pacific region for, for the months uh, to come. We, we don't yet see really an end in insight to that. So just to turn to a few key issues and trends across the Asia Pacific region that I think are important as we think about coming out of the COVID era. Um, and I think both government and business have got important roles uh, to play, both in promoting economic growth, but also supporting long-term uh, economic resilience. Um, some of these trends, I think I'd start with sustainability. You know, it's front of mind for our customers and our consumers around the world. And I think it's crucial that despite COVID, we do not take our eye off the challenge of, cl of climate change, excuse me, um, and I think climate change and finding ways to reduce emissions is of particular importance to the Asia Pacific region and to our, our, our brothers and sisters in the Pacific Island countries. We're proud that New Zealand dairy is the most carbon efficient in the world. We can deliver dairy products anywhere in the world and they will have a third lower carbon footprint delivered than uh, the global average. So we think that our company and our industry has an important role um, and investing in research and development around low emissions food production. And so that we can meet not only nutritious food demand, but also environmentally sustainable food demand. Talking of nutrition, um, one of the things that's interesting is how COVID-19 has really led to an increased focus on health and wellbeing. And we see that continuing to trend, uh, this trend continuing as people come out of the pandemic and think about their, their healthier lives. So we're investing very significantly in product innovation that further supports health and well-being, whether this be things like probiotics to support digestion, digestion or phospholipids, uh, which help manage stress. I think we can all agree COVID has uh, increased the amount of stress in our, our daily lives, unfortunately. Our Anlean adult milk powder is designed to support healthy aging and is clinically proven to provide key mobility-related benefits, targeting muscles, joints, and so forth. Finally, just to mention in terms of trends, I've already talked a little bit about digital, but COVID-19 has accelerated the growing trend across a range of businesses and sectors. We saw our, e our sales via e-commerce channels double in the past 12 months, which is a pretty good indication, I think, of the trend across the region. And we expect that by 2030, this channel will be probably over 30% of our total business. So just to talk, uh, I guess, a business view back on government, um, just quickly on some of the things which, you know, we see government having a role to play. And, and certainly I would start there with targeted assistance. As I said, some economies in the region have been doing it really, really tough. And I think government's providing assistance to each other to, to help those to return to sustainable growth and development is really important. 
you know, fundamental in that, and I was delighted to hear the Indonesian Minister for Trade talk about this, is the role that trade can play, you know, ensuring markets remain open for essential food products and resolving issues around global supply chains to minimise disruption to trade is, I think, one of the most important things that governments in the region can do. Uh, again, efforts to enhance the World Trade Organization and the global rules-based trading system remain fundamentally important. You know, no one would say the WTO was necessarily perfect, but it does provide an important framework in these times for the rule of law and for enforceable trade uh, to occur between countries. The Asia-Pacific region has been at the forefront uh, of trade growth and the place of trade agreements is, is really important to highlight here, whether it be CPTPP, RCEP, um, the free trade agreements that the Indonesian minister mentioned, or PESA Plus. Uh, PESA Plus is, is obviously a, um, quite a unique, but I think very important trade agreement for the Pacific region. Um, it recognizes the unique challenges of some of the smaller Pacific Island economies in international trade, but it also demonstrates their commitment to, to, to open integration of their economies into the wider Asia Pacific economy in a way that's going to support their economic development. And I think it's really important. Um, one area uh, a food company will always turn to the way governments can help is resolving non tariff barriers. Uh, while on average tariffs across the region have reduced over time, uh, we see lots of non tariff barriers whether these be import licensing, regulation, delays in product or plant registrations or so forth. And these are things which just stop trade or, or make trade more expensive than it should be and hurt the interests of customers and consumers. So we very much support uh, governments as they look at post COVID economic recovery and growth, really redoubling efforts to remove barriers to, to trade and investment across the region. I've mentioned climate change, but governments must play a key role. We're conscious with COP26 starting uh, very shortly in the UK that there's a very important series of international meetings. We see already in the Asia Pacific region the impact of climate change, and we think that government and business should partner together to deliver solutions. One, as a company, we're very focused on is how to address uh, and reduce biogenic methane, uh, which is a byproduct of, of a lot of animal-based food production. Um, we are going to put a lot of money into R&D there, and we'd love to partner with governments around the region that similarly want to produce low, uh, develop the science that will help produce low carbon emission food. Um, things like packaging also remain important as we move towards 100% reusable, recyclable or compostable, which is a, a Fonterra commitment. I think I'll just sort of finish with a, with a comment uh, about international connectivity and Sir Richard has, has covered this very well. Um, but I think, you know, we've all been adept at uh, online meetings. Sometimes it feels like we spend our whole life in online meetings, but I think it's very important that as we manage the impact of COVID and we get COVID under control through vaccination and so forth, we are going to get those opportunities to meet face to face with colleagues and I think reopening trade and tourism routes and really giving people the opportunity to travel and meet face to face to do business is going to be really, really important. And uh, we certainly look forward to, to those times coming and working with governments to make them happen. So in conclusion, thank you again to the government of Indonesia and the organizers of this event and really look forward to uh, any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. So that was Simon Parker, Director, Global Stakeholder, Affairs at Fonterra. Now, can I bring back uh, Sir Richard and Simon to be on the panel? All right, well, welcome back again, gentlemen. Um, so we have a little bit of time. Hopefully, uh, you can uh, bear with us on a few questions. So uh, the first one, uh, I think, is probably for the both of you, um, if you have a response at all to, that, to, to this one. In, to what ex, in what extent or to what extent that Indonesia and New Zealand could help the economic recovery in the Pacific region? Simon, please, I, I think there's probably more of a question for yourself. Well, it, it's, it, it's a good question. Uh, the, um, I guess as a, as, as a food business, my first thought is, is the way that by 
Um, you know, we, we have been successful in, in manufacturing dairy products in Indonesia that we then sell through to the Pacific and, and, and help with new nutrition there. Um, you know, and I think uh, many of the Pacific Island countries are very dependent on tourism. And I think finding ways as those industries get rebuilt to make sure that the supply chains so that some of the food products which, which they need for that tourism industry to be successful um, will continue will continue through. I noted the Australian minister talked about the role of targeted development assistance, and I'm not a, a government official anymore, but I do know that, that both New Zealand and Australia, and I'm sure the Indonesian government, are looking at ways that they can help some of those smaller and more vulnerable economies in, in the Pacific Island region um, to, to manage the impact of COVID. So I don't think any of that's straightforward, but um, it's certainly something that, that we, should, we should think very carefully about what we can do to help in practical terms. You know, we need sustainable economies in those small Pacific Island countries, so we should be investing and helping to make that happen. Perhaps, Sir Richard, you could do some, uh, some, some fantastic virtual experiences, uh, give you a reason to visit some of the, uh, the Pacific Island countries. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's, that's uh, I, I take that on board, Simon, because uh, New Zealand has always been one of the primary gateways to the South Pacific, but New Zealand technologists, uh, hopefully and maybe in combination with, uh, with those from other regions, could uh, develop virtual experiences that allow people to travel to these countries initially uh, before traveling there physically. Uh, obviously also the film industry is uh, significantly con contributes to our New Zealand economy. And uh, in turn, the New Zealand film industry has used the South Pacific country locations from time to time. So there is a roll on from the New Zealand film industry being strong and uh, dynamic and viable again for everyone across the South Pacific. Uh, obviously, the, the greatest outcome from your question would be co-production opportunities between our two countries, because uh, that benefits everyone hugely. And uh, it'd be great to think that this may uh, spurn ideas that uh, inspire those sort of co-production potentials. Right. Um, thanks, Richard. The, um, uh, for picking up Simon's challenge. Now, I, I got a follow-up question on this one, right? So. If we were to promote a lot on the uh, virtual um, tour and or, or virtual tourism even so, to what extent that might actually affect the landscape of tourism moving forward? I, I don't think it would have a negative impact. I think it would only have a positive impact because uh, it would be a fabulous way to pe for people to have an initial introduction into a world that they don't know. And... Uh, a huge percentage of the world's population do not have the luxury to travel, but uh, it, is, it is inappropriate that they in turn don't have the opportunity to experience other countries at a tourism level uh, because uh, it should be a domain open for everyone in the world. And if a virtual tourism um, uh, business ecosystem could really start to blossom around the world, it would democratize uh, tourism travel, it would, it would open it up to a, a much greater part of the population of the world, and uh, it would educate and break down ignorances about people's cultural uniqueness across the world, which can only be positive uh, for our collective future as we all try and move forward together. Right, so gentlemen, be, before I move away from tourism, there's a question about uh, how to help the uh, tourism industry uh, in the Pacific Islands. We, we talk about the virtual tourism. Is there any other ideas that you have uh, for one of the questions that's been raised here? About how the Pacific Island countries can actually rejuvenate uh, their economic activities uh, given the border restrictions? I, I don't have any particular insights, Professor, but um, you know, I think certainly 
uh, the key here is going to be vaccination. And I know a number of governments have been have been working with Pacific Island governments. <laughs> I just take the opportunity to reinforce to everyone, please get vaccinated. It's going to solve a lot of problems the quicker we can get our, our vaccination rates up. But, um, and it's encouraging, I think, as different governments grapple, inevitably we move from trying to eliminate or contain COVID to living with it. Um, opportunities will arise. And I think quickly moving into that mindset of putting systems in place. I know as a business, you know, we have 10 or 11,000 employees around the world. Um, it's very hard for us. Uh, we have lots of team members who would like to come to New Zealand for, for, for family or, or business reasons. So we're, we're big supporters of, of finding safe ways to get travel moving again as quickly as possible. I guess, you know, the South Pacific uh, nations have always offered the most unique of tourism offerings to the world, uh, unlike any other part of the world, of course. And if ever there was a time coming where that specific offering, one of tranquility, uh, beautiful cultures, uh, um, engaging and wonderful people, uh, unique uh, environments, et cetera, et cetera. You, got, you could write, uh, you know, a massive marketing brochure on it is going to be so sought after by people that have uh, been in lockdown, harried by their um, urban worlds that they have been stuck in for a very long time. You've got to think that uh, uh, the nations of the South Pacific can... can uh, offer to a very large percentage of the traveling public of the world, something that those that that people are going to be craving for. So if if they're able to get um, the marketing message out to the world, once the once the borders open, and uh, we see a 90% vaccination rate across the world, uh, you can only imagine that uh, that tourism will pick up and uh, there will be positivity for these countries. Uh, I know that's um, very wishful thinking and I'm, I'm certainly the furthest person from an expert on tourism uh, to be talking, but um, I, when I think about just what New Zealand is going to be able to offer uh, to people that have been caught in this perpetual groundhog day of a life, I, I hope that we can offer something very, very special and will bring people back again. Thank you both. The, uh, the ministers from Australia and uh, ministers from the uh, Indonesia as well has talked about collaboration. Right? Does this term ring a bell when it comes to business future of companies such as Weta or Onterra in relation to collaboration around the Pacific region? Our, our business is entirely about collaboration. If you think about the, me, the primary medium that we work in, which is film, and you think about the, the, the primary individual, the director that, that makes film, what is, the, uh, what is the most significant attribute that individual needs? And that is the ability to collaborate. Uh, unless you're making a small stop animation movie in the back of your bedroom, no filmmaker can do it without collaboration. The film industry likewise needs to be so invested in a sense of collaboration. It always has been, and, uh, and, and more so than ever, it will need to be as we find co-production partners and collaborators that will allow us to make... Um, content and product that can travel across borders, across cultures, and inspire new and exciting stories. And those stories are going to often be born out of in-depth collaboration between countries just like our own. Yeah. No, certainly, I, I think collaboration is a great word. And if you think about the essence of collaboration, it's, it's, it's working with partners um, not, in a, not, not to necessarily just consult with them, to actually sit down with them and to create and solve problems together. And I, I think as a company, you know, we've very much tr tried to be working in that space. And in fact, I would say we're increasingly working in that space. I mean, a couple of examples come to mind. We, 
um, we recently uh, reached the milestone of, of our food service business um, cresting $3 billion of annual turnover, which, and it's really only been a business we've been running for about 10 years, but um, what we do in that case is we have our chefs, we've got, um, it must be tens of chefs around the Asia Pacific region where they work alongside our customers to actually create products using our ingredients that the customers want and which we think we can deliver. Um, and that whole model, that $3 billion basis is fundamentally based on, on, on collaboration. And, and you know, we, we, uh, we have people in Indonesia, for example, working on, on, on that basis. I mean, I think the other thing, perhaps some of the really major global challenges we face um, and I mentioned a little bit in my remarks around climate change. You know, we, we need to find a way to um, produce low carbon food um, and the nutritional density of dairy is excellent and low carbon dairy is a fantastic nutrition source with a good environmental footprint, but we still need to crack some challenges, particularly around methane, how to reduce methane from, from, from cows. And that's going to happen through massive amounts of international collaboration. I think in the same way you saw how the globe, global scientists collaborated to fix, to, to develop vaccines for COVID very, very quickly. You know, we'd like to see the same sort of thing happen to address some of these really, um, you know, big challenges around, around science for climate change. But certainly Fonterra is very, very up for that approach. I just, I just comment, Simon, I, I saw what you're describing with your chefs collaborating with in-market locals at a first-hand level when I was invited on a governmental trip to China and uh, in Guangzhou, we saw, we went to one of these centres run by your team and it was extraordinary that uh, interweaving of uh, local tastes and local needs at a food level with New Zealand's ability to really weave magic out of the dairy products at hand to produce new uh, new foods that were uh, selling prolifically into the market. Uh, and, you know, New Zealand is a small country in respect to the world. And when you're a small country at one of the furthest points before uh, hitting the South Pole in the world, you have to collaborate. We are a nation of collaborators. Our country uh, is, is really, um, you know, wh whatever, whatever government is in power at any time, each government, each, con each consecutive government uh, promotes the idea of inter-country collaboration. And uh, we, we, it literally is something we grow up with. It's in our very being. And I don't think there's a New Zealander that doesn't see us as a nation of collaborators and capable of uh, interacting uh, at a very um, uh, powerful level with others around the world. Yep, so Simon, while we are on collaboration, so we know that Fondera is one of probably the few successful models of cooperative around the world. So do you see, how do you see cooperative model being implemented in other countries, for example, those in the Pacific Islands? Would it be possible to do that? Or? Yeah, I was thinking where Richard was speaking, I mean, a, a cooperative is, is about as collaborative as you can get. And, you know, we're very, very proud. Um, in fact, uh, we're, we've been, us and our legacy companies have been cooperative in New Zealand for 150 years. So, uh, you know, and, and, and it's, it's intrinsic to who we are. And look, we are, we are big fans of the cooperative model. So, um, you know, we, we work with other cooperatives around the world and we find there is a sort of natural affinity um, with co-ops. Uh, and uh, so, yes, short answer, um, I think the cooperative model, it's a great way for um, the people who produce the food, for example, where dairy is concerned, to actually own the company that, that produces it for them. And it provides that, that strong sense of identity and vertical integration, but also we find because the business is owned by the families who produce the food, they take a long-term intergenerational view. And I think that's very consistent with, with Pacific Island cultures as well. And I think it's a really positive idea. Thanks, Simon. So off uh, to you, Richard, again. Um, I'm I'll, I'll make sure I try to read this question correct. So 
So one of our greatest concerns from a design perspective was how do you personify trees, as in plants and trees? How do you bring them to life and have them interact as complex, uh, invigorated characters? <laughs> That's <laughs> wonderful. Um, obviously, James Cameron uh, touched on that so significantly through the inspirational ideas within the movie Avatar, a symbiotic, uh, engaged, organic life form through trees that are one with uh, humans and humans at one with, uh, with plant life. I think for too long we have... Uh, we have ignored the fact that we are just entirely uh, organic organisms on this planet, symbiotic, ne needing to be symbiotically engaged with each other. Maybe it's just caught up with us finally at the uh, tail end of the 20th century going into the 21st century. Um, the question is a little bit intangible for me to answer, but I think I, uh, you know, we, we, um, we uh, look forward to the person that cracks that in the real world and it steps out of the realms of fantasy filmmaking, for sure. I think we are getting there because, uh, you know, people are making robots to, to be, you know, hosts in the households these days. So. Well, ju just the fact that we're seeing... Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing councils that are demanding that homes provide all of their own energy through solar uh, panel um, uh, placement on houses. The fact that you have to be able to provide your food source for the residents within the house from the piece of land that the house is on, food forests. You know, th this to some degree is, uh, is the very small and first steps of... Uh, of a public engaging with their environment in a much more um, paternal, thoughtful, uh, graceful way. Uh, for too long, of course, we have uh, we've treated the planet on which we live in a very blunt and coarse way, and uh, it's it's wonderful to see um, such extraordinary endeavours uh, unfolding around the world where there is a sensitivity unfolding. Uh, towards, uh, you know, the, the, the place that we, we sit upon this world. Right, just moving on from trees, so I'll go a bit uh, larger than that, Richard. So how can the creative industry uh, be developed in the Pacific region, knowing that the region has a very rich culture and natural beauty to come with it as, as well? The, you know, the, I, I've, I've said before, there's a thousand... Lord of the Rings stories waiting to be told in our region. You know, Tolkien wrote the sweeping epic piece of, uh, of uh, literature from, by drawing on the cultural reference points of uh, Britain and Europe. But any region in the world is possessing of similar inspiration, no more so than the diversity and uniqueness of the Pacific region. And uh, it, it just waits um, uh, uh, dormant for the writer, for the right writer director to capture the first of these stories and uh, and unfold them. Of course, many have before, but it's not until a a piece of mass media entertainment reaches the scale of a Lord of the Rings uh, type film. A, a avatar scale movie that uh, it truly has the level of um, pop culture imprint across the world that causes a, a shift in awareness um, and uh, perception of a, of a culture and of a nation, uh, of a region, as we saw 20 years ago uh, on the release of the first film, A Lord of the Rings, and the impact it had on New Zealand at a tourism level, at an awareness and cultural level. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we, it all comes down to ultimately individuals uh, who have the uh, commercial um, support of their, of their um, governments, of their local industries, and uh, the inspiration of the stories waiting to be told. Mm. I got a question just while you mentioned the, a lot of the rings, the um, Academy Award winners. So 
So, and you have mentioned about, you know, how we can, you know, hope that the borders are going to be open at some point, but at the same time, uh, you know, we just have to try to sort of like survive uh, in this mode now. So, uh, how would um, how would uh, Weta continue to actually dream up the next Academy Award winning? Be it out there, the lot of something or? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Um, you never set out to win an award. You set out to produce a beautiful piece of entertainment that will engage people. And uh, it comes as a wonderful exclamation mark at the end of the of the sentence if an award is won but taking the the your com, your 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 metaphor of the of an award as the sort of pinnacle of endeavor um, for us we we collectively are always focused on just trying to do the best work we possibly can we don't for a moment profess to be the best in the world, but we want to be the best we can be in the world. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a domain that can be held by anyone anywhere. Uh, it's, it's obviously a sense of self-belief. It's a, it's a sense of uh, certainty in the collaboration of those around you. And it's, a, uh, it's an awareness of... Um, the fact that you've got to uh, you've got to toil to achieve, and uh, I think uh, I think Fonterra would be a living example of that in our country. Most New Zealand businesses uh, speak to that firmly, and there are multiple successful companies in New Zealand that, through very hard work, collaboration with their nearest and dearest, and uh, the inspiration of just giving it a go and uh, proving that we can uh, hold a place on the world stage uh, from our small um, region down here in the South Pacific is, uh, is something that, uh, that we, we must continue to possess. And, uh, you know, long may it last. Um, whether we win another award or not is not the, is not the reason we get up in the morning. It is certainly a, a desire to produce beautiful work that others enjoy, and uh, you know, we'll continue to do it for as long as we can. Now, and gentlemen, of of interest as well. Um, to what extent? So, from a, a scale of um, one to ten, to what extent your company had to rigid your business model since last year? From scale from one to ten, ten means hundred percent change, which I don't think so. So, uh, for us. We, we've got uh, seven different businesses under the one roof. Um, and one or two haven't really been affected at all. Our design studio has really not been affected because that is a business that you can do via Zoom. It is a business that lives entirely within the digital medium. Uh, our manufacturing, on the other hand, you know, at, at the point of lockdown, you can't take the table saw home. You can't take the collaborative nature of building together home to lockdown. You can't, um, you can't expect your clients to necessarily uh, utilize you with as much freedom as they did pre-COVID because they can't just fly across the world to engage with you and you the other way. And then at the very extreme, our tourism offering is, is like all tourism offerings around the world and specifically in New Zealand have probably been affected the most. And so if I was to go from one to 100, we're probably sitting at about 50 to 60%, I would say, in the way that we overall have been affected. Some of, some of us, some of our departments, nearly 100, others not at all. Yeah, it's a, it's a good, I think from our perspective, it's quite hard to answer. I, I think it, the, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, we're probably not particularly impacted at all. Uh, we had one of the best um, financial um, performance years last year, despite COVID. Um, but when I think about that, there was a massive amount of, of hard work and there were plenty of people in our global business who day by day probably felt that their world had been turned completely upside down. And I, I talked a bit, you know, one of the opportunities was 
you know, we, we when Ch China is our single largest market and when we, we saw with the first COVID wave there, our food service business almost literally collapse overnight, we were able to move quickly into consumer products uh, and into, into ingredients. We were able to shift some product from China to other places. Um, so at that time, it was, it was a, you know, a 10 out of 10 on the disruption scale, but then it came right, you know, it, it, it evolved back again. So I think maybe that's an encouraging aspect to this is that, um, you know, I, I think there is light at the end of the tunnel as the world increasingly figures out how to manage COVID. I think we are going to see um, a, a degree of normalcy come back, but we're also going to see, Richard talked about a, a sort of creative boom. I think, I think there will be a, you know, other opportunities with, with strong economic growth. Um, and it, it is encouraging too, you know, we're seeing, despite the impacts of COVID, we are seeing ongoing focus on genuine sustainability, environmental repair and so forth. Um, so I think coming out of this, there is, there is, despite the horrible challenges of it, there is some reason for optimism. That's certainly been our experience. Mm. Yeah, just to follow up, I do saw a question from Slido as well. Uh, you know, to what extent you think the business community in New Zealand can actually influence the government's decision on border reopening? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think, um, you know, we're, we're lucky in New Zealand that there is genuinely a, a very constructive and, and to use that word collaborative approach, I think, between, between business and government, I think. We're united by what we want to achieve, and, and, and clearly the government has a sovereign responsibility to protect the health and well-being of, of citizens. Um, but uh, I think the, the exciting things, and, and, and there's been a group of businesses that have led this, you know, is bringing new technology, new innovation to bear so that we can open up using, using um, you know, progressive technology so that we can do it quickly. Um, I think, uh, I think it's something that everyone wants to happen. It's just making sure we do it safely in a way that's going to protect New Zealanders. Uh, but as I said, I'm optimistic in the new year, we are going to start to see that happening. Hmm. Yep, Jess, and, and probably the last question that we have, now what key advice would you offer to SMEs, small medium enterprises looking to trade in the Pacific region? Well, I've got I've got lots of thoughts on that. I mean, pr probably I think for SMEs, um, recognise there is some really good um, advice uh, and assistance that can be provided. I, I'm mindful of the work that you know my former employee, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and the New Zealand Trade and Enterprise does, which is that they live and breathe to help small New Zealand companies establish offshore offshore markets. Um, so I think you know working getting the support you need, figuring out which are the, the, the market or markets you really want to make your stand in and, and, and go for it. Um, I think there is a collaborative, I mean, obviously we're all competitive businesses, but there is a strong collaborative element amongst New Zealand business as well. And there's an awful lot of assistance and guidance and mentoring and help out there. Um, you know, I think New Zealand survives by exporting and, uh, and there's a lot of people who have who, who want to help companies succeed. Yeah, look, I, I've just got to mirror what Simon said because uh, it's exactly uh, how we have been able to explore markets is by not trying to do it by ourselves. There's experts within our government that uh, departments that are there to assist and help. And there are definitely companies that are looking for collaborative relationships with others. And uh, I think it's a, a great deal about research, uh, defining what you want to do, targeting it with specificity, and then researching who you can do it with, how you can find them, and how you can find the assistance that's going to allow you to achieve your goals. Easy said, hard to do, of course, but uh, those, those government support is out there, and, uh, and it is... Um, it is very positive and very driven to try and help small emerging businesses achieve what they're hoping to do. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, I will close the uh, Q&A session. Sorry for the long Q&A. I thought we, we have the floor to ourselves. We might as well just use 
uh, you know, your experiences to share, um, not just for New Zealanders, but also you know, across the Pacific region and um, Indonesia as well, as well, of course, from ASEAN countries as well. So, so thanks again, um, Sir Richard Taylor and Simon Tucker. Um, your experiences are extremely useful, especially in light. So, so you are flagging, um, you are actually sort of flying the New Zealand flag out there while we, the rest of us are trying to ride it out. So well done. Uh, well, you. well, thank you on behalf of myself. Uh, thank you to your excellencies that have put this on today. Obviously my fellow speakers, Simon Lovely, getting to chat alongside you in this environment. And of course, to all the distinguished guests that have listened in. Uh, wonderful to think that there is such a depth of care and uh, concern for our region that people would uh, want to listen in and think how we can all help each other to improve the situation that we're all in. So cheers to you all. Thank, thank you, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you both. Um, now, so um, we only have a few minutes left, so allow me to uh, make a general uh, conclusion um, in general for this forum. Now, um, for sure, right, we started off with the conversation uh, from the Indonesian ministers and, and we hear about the extent to which uh, growth is extremely important and Indonesia has set an extremely ambitious uh, growth target to be a developed uh, economy. Um, well, 17 years later, right? So, so literally, we are talking about uh, a very large economy out there, probably one of the closest economy other than the Pacific region and Australia to New Zealand. Indonesia is the next better big country around uh, or economy around there. So, so watch that space. But Indonesia is also saying that beyond trade, um, they are not just talking about trade, but also sustainability as well um, as the AI. Um, Park uh, Luhat has mentioned to us about the uh, Indonesia's commitment towards Paris Agreement and as well as the heaps of strategies that uh, he has highlighted around the Pacific region as well to which the Indonesians are pushing hard on things like the maritime strategy and so on and so forth. Now, uh, Park uh, Lutfi um, touched on, on a lot of uh, trade uh, uh, elements of it and Indonesia's trade with the Pacific region as well as Indonesia's trade uh, broadly speaking. Uh, most importantly uh, as the uh, Q&A flag is that you know a big country like Indonesia just basically have to do import and export right so trade is a very important element and even with it within the context of a lockdown it's quite important for Indonesia to remain sort of in some ways open and of course vaccination is extremely important as what uh, Simon uh, has mentioned as well uh, a few times um, to which he encouraged uh, quite a lot there. So, so bear that in mind as well. Now, we also have the Honourable Dr. David Gillespie from Australia highlighting the importance of the relationships between Australia, New Zealand and Indonesia, right? Both bilateral and a little bit of multilateral given the context of the uh, multilateral agreements to which these three countries are in. Um, the big one that is coming up is probably the RCEP, right? The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, to which we're at some point, I think Australia has rectified it. So uh, we are not far away from the completion of the ratification, hopefully by the end of this year, to which then a lot of businesses might benefit from it. Uh, it's good to be live uh, with uh, Sir Richard uh, Taylor. Um, and I'm always going to look forward to his uh, next uh, great movie, uh, of course, it comes with an award eventually, of course, as he highlighted as well. So quite critically, um, I'm already sort of like waiting for the next lot of the rings equivalent out there. And a lot of us uh, in Southeast Asia and the Pacific region would have seen those movies and, and the Hobbits and so on. Um, it's quite important in that particular industry, in the creative industry that is personable. So it's interaction and everything else. So, so it will be quite a, quite a kind, of, kind of interesting that, you know, it, I won't be surprised that that will be one of the first industries to be, you know, off the block when it comes to interaction uh, moving forward when the borders starts to open. It's quite important, even though we try to convert a lot of things into uh, digital, uh, but at the same time, as I alerted to us, digital is not 100% there. And again, a location-based experience as what Sir Richard has mentioned, 
it's very, very important, right, in that particular industry to which Zoom actually plays probably one of the least elements as well. Now, finally, we have Fonterra as well. So we do have, uh, you know, two areas to which New Zealand are very strong in, uh, both Fonterra and Weta in the digital and as well in the, in the dairy sort of larger sort of agri space. Um, you know, in terms of the importance of government, right, using targeted assistance, right, uh, uh, sort of aligning with the uh, World Trade Organization rule of law, which is still a very good uh, way of uh, sort of aligning with the rest of the world, which probably allows a lot more free trade agreements to, to conversations to actually get going. A lot of uh, ring fence around the non-tariff barriers countries are slowly but surely doing their very best bit to try to make sure that those are being reduced even within ASEAN uh, as far as I know. There are also other things that is quite critical when it comes to international connectivity as well, especially in times like this when we have to remain uh, strong and nice. So, so there's, um, overall I would say that, you know, I think what we are facing here in New Zealand is quite similar to what, uh, you know, what they face in Australia, what they face, what you guys face also in Indonesia, as well as the Southeast Asian nations, and in particular, the Pacific regions as well. So we are all, all in this together. And my lessons taking out one big lesson, one big word that takes out from almost every conversation this afternoon has been about collaboration, right? So let's collaborate and, and share a little bit more about the knowledge that we have is almost like, you know, us trying to like, we are all in this together. So with that, uh, I close the session and thank you again for the keynote speaker, uh, Park, uh, and also the other panelists as well. And, and of course we have uh, Sir Richard Taylor and Simon Tucker still there. I also want to thank uh, on behalf of the uh, panel in general uh, to the audience as well, who has been around the Zoom for the last two hours. Now, can I just uh, finish the session by passing it back uh, to the MC, Fernando Aji? Thank you, Professor Xia Hueang, for moderating this forum very well. And thank you to all participants for taking the time to join this forum. I am sure we can all take into account of what has been discussed today by our prominent speaker and panelist. Before closing, please be sure to visit 200 booths in our virtual trade exhibitions area. And don't forget to join Health Forum today at 5.30 p.m. New Zealand time. Also, please be sure to join Tourism Forum and Fisheries Forum tomorrow on the 29th of October 2021. For more information, please visit our website at www.pacificexposition.com .co.nz. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you all once again for joining us today and see you next time. The first Pacific Exposition has created a Pacific momentum been regarded as the most comprehensive expo in the region. Attended by dignitaries, business figures and visitors from 19 Pacific countries and territories, symbolizes togetherness and brotherhood. Promoted investment in tourism in Pacific countries with business deals of 104 million New Zealand dollars. In 2021, we welcome you to the second Pacific Exposition Virtual Exhibition. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, we aim to project optimism by connecting governments, businesses, and key stakeholders to discuss common issues with the Pacific people at the heart of the discussions. As part of a shared commitment to recover together and recover stronger. This exposition will cover current topics. The Pacific Talks will see prominent figures sharing their insights on regional priorities. As we're stepping towards economic recovery, find out what policies lie ahead in the Trade, Investment, and Creative Economy Forum. 
Hear the efforts to strengthen health infrastructures in the Pacific in the Health Forum. Building resilient tourism in a post-COVID future will be the focus of the Tourism Forum. Whilst ensuring sustainable fisheries is the focus of the Fisheries Forum. Check out more than 200 virtual booths from leading businesses and our state-of-the-art business matching spaces. Expand your network by using the latest AI technology in our platform. Be a part.